From up on Black Mountain in Nevada, you can see the town of Henderson. A quiet, hard-working little community. Just 10 miles of desert away are the bright lights and high stakes of Las Vegas. A city for gamblers and risk takers. But in Henderson, people prefer a more predictable lifestyle. Just outside the town is a chemical plant. It makes ammonium perchlorate, a component of solid rocket fuel. Ammonium perchlorate is a unique chemical. If you add it to a burning fuel, you get a chemical reaction that releases oxygen and supercharges the fire. AP is what allows rocket fuel to burn in environments with no air, in space or underwater. It's a key component for America's space program and its nuclear arsenal. But on its own, pure ammonium perchlorate is as safe and harmless as table salt. Or so everyone in Henderson thinks. Until the impossible happens. May 4th, 1988, the day their luck runs out. A warm and windy late morning at the Pacific Engineering and Production Company of Nevada, PEPCON for short. Just over 100 residents of Henderson work here. PEPCON's been around as long as Henderson, and employees like plant manager Bruce Hawker and company controller Roy Westerfield have been close friends and company men for 25 years. It's about 11.30 a.m. A good morning's work is winding down. High winds from the night before have damaged a portion of the roof, and welders are finishing a repair. In the administration building, the plant engineer, Dave Thayer. Sitting at my desk, working on a few projects, wondering what I was going to do for lunch. Maintenance worker Frank Quintana is finishing up his morning's work. Maintenance consists of uh, repairs of machinery, uh, uh, welding, uh, repairing of PVC pipe. And Dave's dad, Red Thayer, is about to change out of his plant clothes to grab a bite in town. High on Black Mountain, a few miles away, is telecom tower repairman Denny Todd and his crew. I had come up that morning with my crew to work on a tower doing routine maintenance. Uh, it was uh, about lunchtime. Shortly after 11.45, workers see smoke coming from a small fire. If the fire comes into contact with AP, it will flare up. But AP dissolves in water, so these fires are easy to put out. It happens from time to time, and there's no need to call the fire department. But this time, the fire isn't going out. Instead, flames spread up along the fiberglass walls. A nearby open drum of floor sweepings is burning. Word of the fire spreads, and Frank Quintana goes to help out. I picked up a water hose and plotted for a little bit, and uh, I started hearing small explosions. The fire spreads to a nearby 55-gallon drum of AP. What happens next alarms everyone. The barrel fires off like a Roman candle. Workers scatter, but six men hang back to fight the flames. Plant engineer Dave Thayer and plant manager Bruce Hawker get word there's a fire spreading fast. I uh, ran into the plant manager's office and stuck my head in his office and I said, hey, Bruce, it's a pretty big fire. Some workers come out onto a nearby loading dock to see the flames and smoke. Mechanical assembler Joe Hedrick. We've had fires in the plant before. I mean, you hit them with water, they go away. It's no big deal. But this fire is spreading wildly, and that's not all. The mini explosions of a fireworks display are too close for comfort. Joe Hedrick starts to get worried, just as his wife pulls into the Pepcon parking lot to drop off his lunch. I was trying to get her, you know, to go ahead and move herself from the parking lot, you know, forget about lunch, just, you know, go on. We, we've got a problem here. Joe can see others in the car, his brother-in-law and five-year-old daughter. 
He assumes his seven-month-old baby is in the car seat. Back in the plant, Frank and his co-workers are losing water pressure, and the flames are gaining ground. And then I lost completely water pressure. Nothing was there. Now the flame is leapfrogging between plastic drums of the chemical AP. The plastic drums looked like to me like uh, snowballs were coming out, uh, and they were just going all over the place. I mean, uh, 10, 12 foot high. In minutes, flames jump from between buildings on the Pepcon site. Veterans of the company, Dave and Bruce, are stunned by what they see. I was confused because I couldn't imagine what was burning that could cause that much flame. Dave Thayer leaves Bruce Hawker watching the fire. He runs back through the administration building to begin evacuations and make sure the fire department has been called. And that's when the first small explosion happened. It's approximately 11.48. Everywhere, employees are picking themselves up off the ground, stunned and shaken. Dave's first thought, his father is somewhere in the plant. At 11.51, 911 receives a call from Pepcon. The voice is later identified as Roy Westerfield, company controller. Up on Black Mountain, Denny Todd was having lunch when it all started. What I saw over there was a fire that had the intensity of a 4th of July sparkler. And I thought that was very strange. I had never seen the brilliance of that before. And Denny Todd makes a fateful decision. He makes a recording that will become Exhibit A in the investigation of a disaster that is as mysterious as it is devastating. The Pepcon chemical plant is on fire, and the fire is spreading with an ungodly speed. Now there's been a small explosion. But the chemical made by Pepcon isn't supposed to burn, much less explode. Pepcon employees are fleeing in terror. Joe Hedrick stops his truck to pick up his foreman and another co-worker. I mean, at this stage in time, it's yeah, there's something horrific has happened to the extent nobody knows. The first police officer to respond to the 911 call has no idea what he's driving into, but he knows it's serious. Officer Bill Adamite. I could vaguely see people evacuating from the plant area, going through the parking lots, people uh, moving in every direction to get away from the fire. Dave heads back towards the plant to search for his father. He had been in the change house when that first explosion occurred, and it had knocked a bunch of lockers over on him. My dad looked at me and he said, well, I guess we're out of business now, because the whole plant apparently at that point was on fire. In the chaos, Dave looks back and sees a lone figure standing like a ghost in the thick smoke. It's Bruce Hawker, the plant manager, looking back into the smoke and flames, transfixed. We yelled at him that he ought to come with us, but my dad said, yeah, I don't think he's, he hears us, and you better go get him. So I asked my dad, I said, uh, do you think you can make it from here? Because he was still limping quite badly, and he said, yes, I can make it from here. So he took his arm off my shoulder, and I just let go of him and turned to run over to where Bruce was, and that's when the first big explosion happened. The time, 11.53. The explosion measures a three on the Richter scale and sends a shockwave out from the Pepcon site for miles around. It stops Officer Bill Adamite dead in his tracks. It was devastating. At, at first glance, if, if you were standing there looking at that, you would imagine that, my gosh, there's gotta be, everyone's gotta be gone. Dave and his father are throwing 100 feet over the tops of cars. When he comes to, Dave is sitting in the parking lot, his father nearby, stuck in a chain link fence. Dave can't understand what's happening. We really couldn't see anything. We did look at the back to see if we could see Bruce again, but we never did see him again. 
Denny Todd realizes he's taping something extremely serious. I was uh, in a very unique crow's nest position with a bird's eye view of what was going on down there. And my emotions were drifting all over the place from uh, making a buck to uh, people must be dying down there. Officer Bill Adamite is stunned, but collects himself as he sees walking wounded coming out of the desert towards the road. People were looking for help. People were pretty much bewildered. People just didn't know what to do. Joe Hedrick just wants to get away, but his foreman insists on going back to look for survivors. He'd done time inside the, the military, I mean, and I'm sure inside the military, you know, you don't leave nobody behind. I mean, but you can't see nothing. There's nothing there. There's no plant. There's no roads. There's no vehicles. Finally, they convince the foreman to get back in the truck. With Armageddon at their backs, Joe will head for Henderson and the hospital. The time is 11.56, and the worst is still to come. Firefighter Jim Blackford and his captain race towards Pepcon. Everybody else is running and trying to get as far away from that incident as possible. And you're running just as fast and going just as quick to go get as close to it as you can. But Jim Blackford won't get that close. It happens at 11.57 a.m. It measures 3.5 on the Richter scale, equivalent to one and a half million pounds of TNT, almost a third of the destructive power of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima in 1945. It shatters windows and damages property as far away as Las Vegas. Officer Bill Adamite sees the shockwave coming at him across the desert. The explosion lifted me off the ground and moved me across a lane and a half of travel to the other side of the road. Officer Adamite is in shock. His eardrums have been ruptured. He's completely disoriented. It was almost something out of a bad movie. You stood up and you looked around and you could see things happening, but you could barely see anything, you could barely hear anything, and you're trying to catch your breath all at one time. I stood on the brakes and covered my face with my arms. It, it looked like a, a nuclear holocaust coming at us. And my captain, he watched it, and the windshield came in on him and cut his face up pretty bad. The fire department sets up a command post a mile and a half down the road from the now devastated Pepcon site. Over the next several hours, Pepcon employees emerge from the desert staggering towards safety. Dave and his father had been crouched near a small pond when the big one hit. That one only blew us probably 25 or 30 feet out into the pond. After the explosion, I sort of, well, you could say I was in shock and didn't know uh, where I was at. Uh, busted eardrums and blood coming down and stuff. And my dad, one of the funny things that happened, he had coveralls on before all this started. And that last explosion blew his coveralls all the way off of him. All he, he was left there in the pond with nothing on but his underwear. All the while, Denny Todd's video camera keeps rolling. At the time, I had no idea what had caused this explosion. And I was very scared as it continued and they got bigger and we could see things flying in the air. And I wondered when it was ever going to stop. The Pepcon plant has been decimated. Now, in the midst of the billowing smoke, there's a distinctive flame that wasn't there before. But it's the toxic cloud drifting above the devastation that worries Dave Thayer and his father. I looked up in the sky, and it was just filled with lots of orange black smoke and lots of debris. And I decided looking up was too scary, so, and it wasn't doing any good anyways. The roads and highways surrounding Pepcon and Henderson are clogged as people try to escape or try to find missing loved ones. Phone lines are hopelessly jammed. The initial missing persons list has 150 names. We had units, uh, we had rescue units and fire trucks units that were coming out and picking up people on the road that had their vehicles that were blown up. 
As the toxic cloud grows, the Clark County Fire Chief orders an evacuation of homes within a five mile radius. For the next hour, the fire department watches helplessly from a distance at what is now clearly a huge natural gas fire. Nobody could possibly get in to fight it. With the chaotic escape from the Pepcon plant, it's been hard to keep track of missing persons. But the list is mercifully shrinking as more and more survivors stagger in. At 1 p.m., the Southwest Gas Company moves in to shut off the gas line. Their pipe is badly ruptured, but the Pepcon plant is already lost. As the high winds disperse the toxic clouds over Henderson, damage reports begin to stream in. Most of the homes in Henderson are damaged. Schools, shops, even the local hospital have shattered glass and falling debris. The Las Vegas airport, 30 miles away, reports cracked windows. At the hospital, a makeshift triage unit serves over 300 walking wounded. Joe Hedrick arrives at the hospital to find his wife's car, the sides pushed in, the windows missing. But what terrifies him most is the baby's car seat. I mean, there was blood on the headliner, there was blood inside the van, and I don't know where, where my wife, where my children are. What happened? His wife and five-year-old daughter are safe in the hospital. And the baby wasn't in her car seat that day. She'd been left at home with a sitter. It takes over six hours for the fire to burn itself out and to account for all the Pepcon employees. By six o'clock, only two remain missing. Roy Westerfield, last seen trying to coordinate emergency response, and Bruce Hawker, the plant manager. Only two fatalities. It seems a miracle. But now the questions begin. Solving the mystery quickly is a matter of urgent national security. But what could have gone wrong in a plant that produces AP, a product that isn't meant to burn, much less explode? The damage is mind-boggling. 3,176 homes have been seriously damaged. 372 citizens have been injured, including 15 firefighters. And two Pepcon employees are dead. The state of Nevada has a heavy concentration of aerospace and military installations. In the days following the explosions, conspiracy theories abound. People even talked about the possibility, could it have been lasers? a lot of other really obscure and really strange theories, but there was no evidence to support any of this. These theories give way to eyewitness accounts of a seemingly accidental fire that simply grew and got out of control. But the path from a small runaway flame to this devastation is incomprehensible. This mystery needs to be solved. And not only for the sake of the citizens of Henderson, Washington, too, needs answers. This is a chemical which was and is crucial to, to the national interest. We use it for the space program, we use it for the defense program. So we couldn't afford having such a critical chemical blow up with no understanding of what had happened. One of the first shocking facts brought to light the day after the explosions was the amount of AP stockpiled at Pepcon. 8 million pounds stored in polyethylene drums and aluminum bins all over the site. Two years earlier, the Space Shuttle Challenger had exploded shortly after takeoff, and the space program was put under a moratorium. But production of AP continued, and the stock just piled up. Now that huge inventory is gone. There is only one other manufacturer of AP in the Western world, a company called Care McGee, only three miles down the road. The Care McGee plant temporarily shuts down as well. If AP alone caused this disaster, they have to figure out how and quickly. A league of scientific teams descend on ground zero, each recruited by a different interested party to get to the bottom of this mystery. 
Aptec Engineering Services represents the insurance companies. Kimball Clark, mechanical engineer and thermal sciences specialist. How in the world did ammonium perchlorate actually explode? Because a, a lot of people believe that it couldn't explode, including employees at PEPCON. Jeff Egan, metallurgical expert. The place was actually uh, just a, a whole bunch of mechanical skeletons. Exponent Failure Analysis Associates is recruited by PEPCON. Ali Riza, Exponent's principal engineer. The fact that ammonium perchlorate had detonated so violently and so suddenly was a surprise to all investigators who, who responded to this accident. Exponent's vice president, Robert Caliguri. I've never been in a place where the destruction was so, so horrific and so complete. And Craddock, Hayer and Associates is hired by Southwest Gas Company. Investigative engineer, Roger Craddock. When I got there, it was a facility that was basically completely gone. For these veterans who thought they'd seen it all, the scene was overwhelming. Job one is to figure out the layout of the destroyed plant. Pepcon is on the outskirts of Henderson, Nevada, about 10 miles away from Las Vegas. The administration building is here. The production facility is here. AP is pumped into a large drying tank then loaded into 55-gallon plastic drums. There are hundreds of drums inside the facility and thousands more stacked outside. Just east of the plant, here, are hundreds of aluminum bins of AP, over 8 million pounds in total. Here is a natural gas pipeline buried four feet below the ground. It runs all the way to Las Vegas. Investigators at the scene pick through the rubble looking for clues. Fragments of buildings, machinery, and the aluminum bins that stored AP are everywhere. There are several huge and distinct craters in the ground and the blown out remnants of the natural gas pipeline that ran right through the Pepcon facility. It was as if somebody had taken that pipeline and smashed it into a little tight bundle of twisted metal. Everyone's first thought surveying the wreckage is that something cataclysmic happened here, maybe a bomb. But they quickly learn that they've got another piece of evidence, a uniquely revealing record of the disaster. Wow. <laughs> My first reaction when I first saw the Todd tape is, we got to get that. Denny Todd's record of what happened at Pepcon from the vantage point of Black Mountain. The Black Mountain videotape was, was essentially absolutely crucial to our investigation. And right away, the Todd tape provides some illuminating information that the fire spread with enormous speed, that there were a total of seven explosions, and that at least two were true detonations. They were true detonations because there was a supersonic shock wave that emanated and one could see it on the film and see it moving out into the desert for many miles. And scientifically, what a detonation is, is um, the situation where the chemical reaction and the explosive material is proceeding in that material faster than the speed of sound in that material. So it's, in this case, traveling many thousands of feet per second. Three million pounds of ammonium perchlorate basically uh, disappeared instantly in much less than a second. That's a detonation. But for the investigators, this is a big problem. AP isn't supposed to explode or even burn. AP is used to increase the intensity of a combustion, but it is not a fuel. On its own, AP is not flammable. To solve this mystery, investigators need to back up to the moment of ignition, 10 minutes or so before the explosions that erased Pepcon from the map. It all starts with fire. 
The Pepcon chemical plant has been devastated by a fire, followed by a series of massive explosions. But investigators have a problem, because AP, the product produced at the plant, isn't meant to burn or explode. It was a complete mystery at first, because what we had was uh, the videotape that showed us uh, the, all the explosions. We had the basically the, the corpse of the plant itself, and then we had this pipeline which had ruptured. The Clark County Fire Department and Steelworkers Union of America conduct separate investigations of their own. The union is quick to point a finger at Pepcon's safety record and an inspection report written only five years earlier. Ironically, it may have been safer on the day it exploded than it was five years ago, but, but the company's luck just ran out. But Pepcon owners defend themselves and insist earlier complaints of safety hazards at the plant had long since been addressed. But in the wake of the disaster, these questions just won't go away. Each employee who was at Pepcon that morning is interviewed, but no one is sure of how or where the fire started. All agree that it had already been burning several minutes before being noticed in the corner of the Batch House building. We called the Batch House because ammonia perchlorate is basically made, or they're making it in batches. So what they do is they send this over, the, the wet ammonia perchlorate comes into the Batch House to the big dryer that's in there, and it's then dried and becomes a finished product. Investigators comb over the area that once was the batch dryer building and carefully excavate and document as they go along. According to eyewitnesses, the fire started here. And something catches Roger Craddock's eye. We found wood from pallets. We found uh, some other materials indicating that essentially that this material had been within the batch house and had been swept up. And we knew that there were drums that they were using for trash barrels. What else was swept into the bins? Ammonium perchlorate. And we knew that people would sweep up pieces of, or, or components of ammonium perchlorate, and they would just be like you'd sweeping up dust. They'd be put in, in these old drums with whatever else was there. In fact, as Craddock realizes, there was AP residue all over the facility, even in the asphalt that covered the grounds. But nobody thought it was a problem. We've had ammonium perchlorate fires at the site before. Ammonium perchlorate is very soluble in water. You hit it with water, the fire goes out because the AP dissolves. I knew that if you just tried to light ammonium perchlorate on fire, nothing's going to happen. If you light it on fire with combustible material that is impregnated or contaminated with oxidizer, you can get the, that combustible material to burn vigorously. But I also knew that under normal circumstances, you cannot get ammonium perchlorate to burn on its own. And Pepcon employees knew all about that. That's why plant workers did a complete change of clothes before heading off the site. More than one employee had a case of spontaneous combustion when clothing, contaminated with AP dust, got too close to a cigarette. The ignition source is a mystery. Witnesses say that welders were repairing a damaged roof in the area. Maybe there was a mechanical failure or someone was careless with a cigarette. With the scale of the devastation, establishing a source of ignition would be difficult. But what happened after the ignition is starting to make sense. The winds were strong that day. Most of the buildings at Papcon were constructed with corrugated fiberglass coated with a flammable resin. Once the flames met the siding, the fire went beyond anything that Pepcon employees could handle by themselves. The plant had no sprinkler system and the water pressure was not sufficient to put out the fire. Before long, the fire reaches the plastic drums of AP stacked in the batch house. Investigators demonstrate what happens when AP meets burning plastic. There were hundreds of polyethylene drums full of AP in the immediate vicinity. Eyewitnesses agreed that as the fire grew, those bins began to pop and the fire spread more quickly because flaming polyethylene bins were hurtling into the air and igniting new fires where they landed. You'd think that this was case closed. Pure AP can't burn, 
But if it's contaminated with flammable material and the deadly mixture comes into contact with a source of ignition, then it will flare with ferocious intensity. But the case is far from closed. Neither Roy Westerfield nor Bruce Hawker died as a result of this fire. They died as a result of this explosion. It was the explosion that did all this property damage as far away as Las Vegas. And investigators still can't explain what caused it. It was clear that the fire spread could be explained by the polypropylene barrels which were used for on-site storage. But the poly barrels could not explain the detonations. And the poly barrels could certainly not explain why the fire first started. Then, Pepcon makes a public announcement. They had released to the, to the press that ammonium perchlorate that they made was stable, that it didn't burn, that it didn't explode, uh, and that essentially it was an oxidizer. It was not a fuel, it was an oxidizer that, uh, that would not cause and did not and could not have caused this. And exponent failure analysis associates hired by Pepcon think they found the real reason behind the runaway fire following a trail that leads back to the damaged gas line. All the investigators agree the pipe damage is interesting. There were areas of that pipeline where the pipe was literally uh, smashed uh, absolutely flat and looked like a noodle, uh, all wavy and, and absolutely crushed. And then in other sections of the pipeline, uh, the pipe was burst open, like what we call a fish mouth uh, opening. To expone it, the fish mouth opening suggests a pressure release from inside the pipe. This pipe might have been the source of Pepcon's troubles. All testing and all investigations prior to this accident had confirmed that ammonium perchlorate could not detonate unless it was mixed intimately with a fuel source. The fuel? Natural gas leaking from the pipeline prior to being damaged in the explosion. Exponents theory? The day of the accident, Pepcon grounds were already saturated with natural gas. Exponent sets up an experiment in the desert to show that AP and natural gas on fire is a volatile cocktail. According to Exponent, the original fire occurred when natural gas came into contact with an ignition source. It was the combination of millions of pounds of AP and burning natural gas that caused the devastating explosions at Pepcon that day. But they'll have to prove the pipeline running under Pepcon was already damaged and leaking prior to the morning all hell broke loose. Suddenly, a line's been drawn in the sand, and the competing investigation teams are taking sides. With an estimated $80 million worth of property damage, the liability of their respective clients is at stake. The attention of investigators is focused on one damaged section of pipe in the gas pipeline that ran the length of the site. Alongside the production facility and the batch house. We wanted to understand the role of the pipeline in the whole, whole accident scenario. This particular gas line is ERW pipe, electrical resistance welded. It was laid in the mid-50s, before the Pepcon plant was even built. It turns out Southwest Gas received a warning about this pipe just six months before the disaster. So there was a question hanging over the pipeline, was this a generic weakness that we knew about in the industry contributing or responsible for this incident. If you're going to operate a pipeline with low frequency ERW manufactured pipe steel in it, you need to inspect it very, very frequently or dig it up and replace it. But what was the condition of the specific piece of pipe that ran through the plant? Aptec wants to find out. Uh, we, we basically took a video camera, put it on a crawler, and we ran it through the pipeline. What those videos told us was that the pipeline was internally in excellent condition. We anchored the line in several locations, and then we proceeded to go through a series of pressure tests for the line itself. We found no leaks. But the large crater left by the last explosion was where the investigators found the damaged pipe. 
Did this area have a gas leak before the explosion? Exponent thinks so. But there's a snag. The distance from the damaged pipe to the batch house is more than 600 feet. But Exponent says they have an explanation. It is well known in, in the pipeline industry that you can have a leak in a pipeline and yet have something catch fire or blow up some distance away, hundreds of feet, thousands of feet. And what is known in the pipeline industry is that natural gas will migrate along a pipeline because that is a path of least resistance. The debate heats up over something called annulus, a small airspace that sometimes forms between the pipe and the soil that surrounds it, created in certain types of soil conditions through settling of the ground. And according to Exponent, providing a channel along the outside of the pipe for leaks to flow. Exponent does extensive soil tests looking for proof that the soil was saturated with natural gas. They take soil samples from key areas all around the PEPCON site. We went ahead and took a look at this. The initial preliminary examination as far as the initial soil samples that were taken did not show any residual natural gas. Subsequent testing that was run uh, did show residual amounts, small amounts of uh, natural gas or methane in four to six parts per million, which is uh, an extraordinarily low amount. Craddock claims that methane traces that low could be the result of microorganisms in the soil. A microbiologist confirms those microorganisms are there post-explosion and produce methane. Craddock conducts his own experiments on migrating gas. Just what would happen to natural gas if it were leaking at the point of the pipe damage? Natural gas is lighter than air and would more naturally go up and sideways. According to Craddock, the desert ground at the PEPCON site is loose, rocky, and porous. The surface area between the crater and the batch house is mostly asphalt, but it has many cracks that predate the explosions. What would make it go 700 feet along a pipeline, absent an annulus, which we didn't find, rather than go three feet up to the pavement and come out through the cracks. But Exponent has a piece of evidence that looks compelling. They focus on the piece of pipe that was found split open and examine it under an electron microscope. We look for evidence of what we call chevron marks. Chevron marks are marks left on the surface of a steel in the, in, in the wake of a rapidly propagating crack. It is the presence of the chevron marks that can help you really take a puzzle that makes no sense, a bunch of pieces, broken pieces, and put them back together in a logical way that fits with the evidence and can, and can provide you with the story as to what happened. Exponent claims the chevron marks prove the pipe burst from internal pressure and predate the explosion. They're satisfied that the case is closed. Their conclusion? The fire started because uh, natural gas which was escaping into the batch house building found an ignition source. And the initial flames attacked a plastic barrel which was full of AP. The plastic is combustible. The plastic in combination with the ammonium perchlorate is very combustible. The fire spread because there was a lot of AP on the site and it was stored in combustible containers. Our finding was that the reason the detonations occurred was because the AP came into intimate contact with the natural gas, which was present due to the leaking pipe on, on the PEPCON site. But perhaps the chevron marks could have been formed the moment of the explosion and not before. Aptec is ready to go back to an old friend with some new science. What makes the investigation of this mysterious accident different is what Denny Todd likes to call his eagle's nest view and the videotape he captured of the unfolding disaster. But there's a limit to what investigators can glean from the video because of the tremendous amount of smoke. Aptec, the investigative team hired by the insurance companies, turns to a very special computer graphics company for help. It involved a, a, a sort of technology at the time that was just developing, which was the image enhancement process to look at or look through what historically had been an impossible thing to do. 
Z-axis superimposes a 3D Pepcon site plan on top of Todd's video, carefully matching the scale and angles perfectly, clearly identifying every building and quantities of AP stored on the site. What the, the, the Z-axis methodology did was to peel back that smoke so we could look under it and see where these explosions and fires were occurring. For the first time, investigators can actually see for themselves the exact locations of the explosions. The animation also confirms the early fires in the polyethylene bins project burning matter into the air and start new fires where they land. But what Aptek really wants to know is the precise location of the largest explosions. Were they the result of a mixture of AP and a large amount of burning gas? It was almost like a crystal ball when Z-axis peeled back that smoke and showed us the relationship between the location of the explosion and where our pipeline rupture was. And what we discovered was that the major explosions were centered in the areas where most of the AP had been stored and not at the location of the split in the natural gas pipeline. Aptek discovers that the first large explosion happened northeast of the plant, over 200 feet from the damaged pipe, and the last explosion occurred in the densely stored aluminum bins of AP to the east of the Pepcon complex. But this means that what exploded was uncontaminated AP in sealed bins. Does this mean that the investigation is back at square one? Pure ammonium perchlorate doesn't explode, but the day the Pepcon chemical plant was destroyed, thousands of tons of pure, uncontaminated AP in sealed containers blew up with the force of a powerful bomb. In the United States, ammonium perchlorate is classified as an oxidizer. Reclassifying AP as an explosive would be costly. It would have a huge impact on storage and transportation regulations. A lot of people had an interest in trying to prove to themselves in the world that in fact this uh, material, ammonium perchlorate, was only an oxidizer and couldn't explode. Only when investigators superimpose a 3D model of the Pepcon facility over video footage of the plant are they forced to reconsider the issue of storage on the Pepcon site? Uh, the ammonium perchlorate was stored in aluminum tote bins, and there were hundreds of those tote bins originally on site, and one, one of the things that struck me is how few of them were left. Was there some special property of the aluminum bins that contributed to the last explosion? What happens to aluminum when it's exposed to prolonged, intense heat? What we had was um, aluminum, which is a very reactive metal, um, participating in this explosion, actually uh, chemically burning at a very rapid rate with this incredible amount of oxygen uh, created by the detonation of ammonium perchlorate. So what happens if you mix burning aluminum with AP? John Wellinghoff, a lawyer for Aptek. Well, we make solid rocket fuel by grinding up aluminum and polyethylene and putting it with ammonium perchlorate. You can visualize that if you decompose the aluminum containers containing the ammonium perchlorate sufficiently enough while it's being heated that you could get a very violent explosion. You know, does it make sense to store this stuff in the same material that you use to make rocket fuel? Exponent does their own controlled experiments burning AP in aluminum bins. And in their experiments, there is no explosion, only burning and melting. Craddock try their own experiments, burning AP in bins, and they get small explosions. But the tests are inconclusive. No one has reproduced the extreme circumstances of that last day at the Pepcon plant. 8 million pounds of AP, sealed in thousands of polyethylene and aluminum bins stacked row after row. In the end, Aptek and Craddock conclude the explosions resulted from a chemical interaction between superheated AP and the plastic and aluminum bins. And the point of origin of the original fire? Perhaps a welder's spark or a stray cigarette. They cannot say for certain. Exponent and Pepcon still maintained that the cause of the accident was a gas leak that found a point of ignition. 
But in 1992, Pepcon, Southwest Gas, and several buyers of Pepcon's product reached a confidential settlement with insurers, and it appeared that legal proceedings were at an end. But one of Pepcon's insurers didn't settle and sued Southwest Gas. In December 1992, the jury found that natural gas was not leaking prior to the fire and ruled in favor of the gas company. Kerr McGee was back in production three weeks after the Pepcon accident. Several years after the Pepcon disaster, the new company bought out its only competitor, Kerr McGee. It now enjoys an ammonium perchlorate manufacturing monopoly. Today, storage and housekeeping at the new plant are much improved over the old Pepcon practices. And there are some other differences. It's much more spread out. The buildings, instead of being 30 to 50 feet apart, are 200 to 500 feet apart. Also, the, the other major difference is at our facility in Utah, we don't have any buried natural gas lines or other fuel lines. They're all above ground so that they can be monitored and observed. As for the people of Henderson, they remember the day Pepcon blew up as the day when two men were killed, but dozens more miraculously survived. It was an amazing day. It was an amazing day and it had a, a real solemn and somber and humbling end to it. And, uh, it did.